Very good. All right, so I am recording this lecture. If, it, if it's successful, I'm going to go ahead and, um, and try to put it up on Beachboard. All right, so this is kind of annoying here, but anyway. All right, so let's get to, uh, let's start lecturing. So I'm going to go in between this and the notes and uh, whiteboard. So uh, hopefully you guys can keep up um, real quick on, let me go in, in full screen mode. So everyone can see. All right, so temperature, you don't need to, you need to worry about the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Um, but if you need to know what it is, because there's a couple of slides before this that you can look at. To describe what the zeroth law. All the zeroth law says if if the temperature of A is equal to the temperature of B, then the temperature of C is equal to both the temperature of A and temperature of B. And I know it's confusing, but basically all that's saying is if the temperature, for example, of an object that I have is 60 degrees Celsius, and I have another object, it's different material, different size, that's also 60 degrees Celsius. Then therefore the two have the same temperature. We can postulate that there is just because it's a different material doesn't mean it's 60 degrees is 60 degrees, regardless of the material, regardless of the size. And so that A is the first material, B is the second bigger material, that's 60 degrees C. C would be a thermocouple or a therm or a thermometer in this case. If that temperature reads also 60 degrees, in other words, if I'm touching one of the materials and it reads 60 degrees, then therefore. All three are in thermal equilibrium. All three, in other words, 60 degrees is the same for both materials. That's all the, you know, it's it's more of a physical, it's kind of a um, kind of a mind type. You have to kind of tell your mind that, hey, if I take the temperature of this device and if it tells me it's 60 degrees C, and if I can trust my thermometer, then it is 60 degrees C. It doesn't matter what I take the temperature of. of. So that's, in a nutshell, that's what the zeroth law is. All right, so now um, in terms of what, this means here we have the temperature of, we're going to be using Kelvin, remember uh, SI units? So Kelvin is equal to the temperature at Celsius plus 273.15. That's how you determine the Kelvin, right, the, the Kelvin scale. So you guys should already know this. Uh, don't worry about ranking. Um, and you don't really need to, you, you, you should worry about conversions. I think that's a nice thing to do. So the conversion, right? So it tells us that the, let me go ahead and create a new. So the, the conversion scale, just give me a second, please. Stand by as I get my notes. All right, basically tells us that the temperature, um, what was this saying? The temperature uh, at, if you need to convert from Celsius, right? You can just probably go to your cell phone and, and do the conversion, but it's uh, 1.8 times uh, times the temperature at degree C plus 32, right? So for example, the temperature uh, at degrees F, if I put in the boiling po uh, temperature of water, 1.8 times, 100 degrees C plus 32, that better be equal to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, right? That's all it tells us. And if you put uh, the temperature for zero for, at Fahrenheit, if you put in the, zero, the freezing point of water, so it's 1.8 times zero plus 32. So we know that just by inspection that this is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, all right. That's all you need to know here for temperatures. All right, so now let's go back to the slides. And um, we'll go to the next slide over, the next slide over that. All right, so now we're gonna be talking about pressure. And hopefully you guys can see that. I think I prefer just to have this just um, like this, instead of kind of giving going to the full screen mode. All right, so now we have the pressures and we have that one Pascal is equal to one Newton per meter squared. Uh, we have one bar is equal to 0.1 megapascal. So let me ex let me go back to the notes here, just one second. You have these lecture notes. Um, let me go ahead and just 
tell you what that means. So uh, again, one Pascal, this is very important. We're gonna be using Pascal a lot is equal to uh, one Newton per meter square. Okay. And that's the definition of a, of a Pascal. Um, this is also, we, we're gonna, you know, we, we rarely use the termination, uh, the, the bar as pressure, but one bar is pretty close to one atmosphere, but it's not quite. Uh, it's actually equal 10 to the five Pascal, which is, you know, it's equal to 100,000 Newtons per meter square, since a Pascal is a Newton meter square. And then uh, this is also equal to 0 0.1 megapascal. Now, it turns out one bar uh, is equal to the pressure, is equal to the atmospheric pressure at, um, at about, uh, what is it? Maybe at 111 meters. So, uh, so it's at 100, or basically in, you know, most of you guys know um, feet, right? So it's about 366 feet. So if you go 366 feet into the air, the you're not here in, in Long Beach, we're at one atmosphere. We're at, um, and some of you guys, not everyone's here is out at Long Beach, right? You might actually be in, the, in a warm bar environment. You might be 100, 366 feet above, above sea level. But here in Long Beach, uh, we, we're at one atmosphere. So basically, the pressure at one atmosphere is equal to, uh, let's go just PSI right now. It's 14.69 PSI, which is equal to 101.3 kilopascal, right? But, and this is kind of sort of equal to, uh, it's I think it's 0.98 bar. So one bar, you got to climb up. Um, and the reason they do that is because, well, because it's nice, right? It's, it's kind of nice round numbers. Instead of saying, you know, one atmosphere equals 101, uh, three, I'm not even sure what the next digits are. It's not that. Instead of saying uh, the pressure is that, it's nice. It's kind of nicer just to say it's basically one times 10 to the five Pascal, right? It just kind of makes it cleaner. That's what one bar is. So where where is uh here in Los Angeles? Where do you think? So downtown LA. LA is is at about 300. I think it's about 370 feet elevation. So it's the pressure there is equal to pressure is uh, is equal to and so let's say in LA is equal to one bar. All right, so that's that's the skinny on the bar. Um, now going back to what else? Let's see what other pressure scales are important with with that. Uh, let's see any other. That's pretty much it. Now we we're going to talk about um, pressure, other type of pressure. So gauge pressure. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. So the next slide has us going. Uh, so there's different pressure pressure measurement devices. Well, we, you know we we might be familiar with them, but they're usually these dial pressures gauges. Uh, you can have electronic sensor pressures. Uh, lots of different pressure measurement devices, um, but now the question is: when you read the pressure, what usually do you read? Right? There's two. There's two things that you can possibly read. There might be different scales, right? You might be reading uh, something, for example, barometric pressure is usually measured in bars, um, but usually here in England, in the U.S., we talk about psi if you're measuring your tire pressure. Um, but you may not be, right? It might be an SI unit, so then in that case you're measuring Pascals. So let's go and talk about more about that in, in, in detail. So uh, there's two things you got to look out for when you're dealing with pressure. It's called uh, gauge pressure and so gauge, there's, there's gauge pressure, we're going to say B, P, gauge, and then there's P, absolute pressure. 
All right, so pressure gauge is what you would like. You would you just let's look at your car, right? I don't know if you guys ever measured the tire pressure in your car or in your bicycle, um, but that pressure usually is doesn't account for the atmosphere, right? So it is. Um, it's basically. So the pressure. Let's let's maybe this is the best way to think about it. Pressure absolute is the complete pressure, or uh, total pressure. Compared to uh, to to a vacuum, a perfect vacuum. Right. So it's like what compared to outer space, right? What what's the pressure? That's what it is. So pressure gauge is basically a subset of that. Let's see if I can. Here we go. So it's basically equal to the pressure, the the complete the. It's the real pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. So, for example, your um, your tire pressure. Let's just say you need to set your tire pressure is thirty psi. Okay, I'm sorry I said that we would be doing um, SI units, but in this case we're talking about things that we understand. So uh, we understand tire pressure to be around thirty psi, whether it's your car or your probably your bicycles around that. Uh, this isn't this doesn't this is not absolute pressure. This is the the gauge, right? In other words, um, since the atmospheric pressure, oops, is equal to 14.69 psi, we're not saying it's it's the actual pressure inside the in your the bicycle is in 30 minus 14.69, right? That then that means the real true pressure inside your your car. I'm sorry, inside your tire would be half of what you're trying to obtain, right? So this is your gauge pressure. So it assumes that an empty tire is zero pressure, right? But in reality, an empty tire has atmosphere in it, right? An atmosphere has, has a pressure. So that's what that means. Um, so the total, really, pressure absolute is equal to the, um, it's basically equal to the gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure. All right, so the total, so your car, let's go back to the tire, tire pressure. Uh, let's say absolute tire pressure is equal to, um, it's actually equal to the gauge pressure, which is equal to 30, which we did, we determined that to be here, plus um, 14.69. So the true pressure is equal to, what is that, 44? 0.69 psi. So that's for the absolute tire pressure, right? But we don't measure our tire pressure that way. So again, there's two things. When you measure pressure, what is it? You're looking for the absolute pressure or the gauge pressure. And usually I tell you, in an exam, you never have to worry about what that is. Uh, you can always ask me during the exam. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to do that uh, virtual, but... <laughs> Uh, anyway, you can always uh, text me or ch uh, chat me and say, "Hey, did you mean absolute or pressure or gauge?" You know, if I don't by accident, don't put it down. Usually in this class, we're dealing with absolute pressures. All right. When we start talking about uh, pressure inside of like a, for example, we're going to be talking about uh, steam steam tanks and pressure inside the tanks. Usually, it's 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 absolute pressure. We're not, you know, because these are closed off to the atmosphere, so. All right. Yeah. Between gauge and absolute. Is it, is that what you're saying? Um, let me let me see if I can illustrate that a little bit better. The difference is that uh, there is so the difference is that so let's just say you have pressure here on this diagram. Right, um, and just say this is one atmosphere. Remember, I said one atmosphere of pressure is equal to. Uh, te I'm sorry. It's equal to 14.69 psi, which is equal to 
uh, kilopascal, right? That's atmosphere. That's the pressure at, at sea level. So let's just say this is what one what, what atmosphere is, right? And that's uh, AT, AT, we're going to say PATM. Hopefully you can read that. All right. So that's the pressure from here to here is, again, PATM. And then there's the pressure whenever, so let's just assume that the pressure that's around us, that's zero pressure, right? For us, right? In terms of when I'm, you know, I'm trying to use the analogy of your, your car tire, right? If your car tire has a hole in it, and if I ask you what's your tire pressure, you're not going to say it's 14.69 PSI, right? Do you understand? It's going to be, you're going to tell me, ah, oh, it has a hole in it. The pressure is zero, right? So what you do is usually measure that's the, but that's the gauge pressure. Usually you measure gauge pressure, you ignore atmospheric pressure. And then what you do is you give me the gauge measurement. It's zero basically it's zeroed out at atmosphere. And that right now, you know, it and and what we do is is that's 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 the gauge pressure, right? That's the the you know the, of your tar, of your tire, you know, of your car might be 30 psi. But we all know that here it's 10 point, um, what is it, 10.49 PSI. In other words, that's what one atmosphere is. But we don't, again, we, when you when you measure the, when you tell me the uh, tire pressure, your tire pressure, you're giving me the that atmosphere is zero, basically. You're giving me a reference starting from atmosphere going forward, right? So what absolute is, is takes the whole thing. Right. So P absolute the so for your car, your tire, if you say if I say give me the absolute pressure of your car tire, what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, all right, the absolute pressure of my car tire is equal to my gauge pressure that I read off the gauge, which is equal to thirty PSI, plus I have to factor in the atmosphere, right? Fourteen point six nine PSI, which is equal to uh 40, did I say, okay, it's 44.69 PSI, all right? That's the difference between the two. The the absolute takes into account atmosphere. So does that is that clear? Okay, all right, you're welcome. I got to keep an eye on the clock here. Um, so I know that because people sometimes confuse the two, and, and that's that's the bottom line with atmospheric pressure. All right, let's let's continue. Um, let's see. So what's next on our slides here? We just covered that. Um, we know that that the um, for example, if we had uh, just say you're on on um, at the edge of 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 a river or a tank, right? This is Let's see, um, the surface of the water is like this, right? So I have a little arrow here to indicate this is water. Right? And the bottom, so this is, let's just say, let's call this a, a lake, right? And here's the ground or the embankment of, of the, the lake. So we know that, um, that let's see, I'm going to see, see if I can draw a straight line. The pressure was going to be, here is P atmosphere, right? We know that assuming, so you're outside the lake here, the temper, the pressure here at the surface of the lake is P atmosphere. Now what's the pressure at the bottom of the lake, right? We'll call that, um, let's call that P2, right? Or P2, and then we'll call this P1. To get to the, the pressure, because this is, if this is, it doesn't have to be water, but it's just a liquid, but let's just call it water. So the pressure distribution is actually a straight line. Again, uh, maybe I'll put P2 there. Um, all right, sorry about that. Let's put P2 there and P1 here. And the pressure distribution is the pressure against this embankment, this or the side of the tank. It's these arrows, right? And it's gonna, it's basically linear, linear function of depth. So. It's maximum at the bottom of the tank or at the lake, and it's minimum at the very top surface. It's actually zero. It's at one atmosphere at, at the top surface, right? 
So we know that the pressure distribution, the pressure at two is equal to, really is equal to one atmosphere, the pressure there, plus the depth of that water, right? Plus rho g, and we're gonna say h, where h is basically the distance from the surface to the bottom of the lake. So the total pressure, P2, is equal to the atmosphere plus the uh, density of the liquid times gravity times H. And sometimes if, for example, um, we know that the change in pressure is equal to P2 minus P1, right? That's the total pressure change. Um, if, for example, the uh, there's density if density varies so if density varies with uh, depth then we know that this is equal to uh, the change in pressure is equal to the we have to integrate over the density over the over the distance to the bottom so you're going to say it's equal to the integral of rho times g d h, right? If we just say that the variable is h, I probably should have used a different variable, but if just say h can vary. So, you know, and assuming that gravity is constant, just say that the, the depth of this lake is is insignificant relative to the diameter of the earth, then if we can just pull gravity outside of the differential equation, then you would have minus g times the integral from two to one, of rho dh, right? And if by some reason rho is constant, right? Then we it's basically rho g times h2 minus h1, right? And that's basically this this change in, in in depth here, and it leads us back to this original equation. So again, this equation assumes it's constant density liquid and that gravity is constant and you know that kind of thing now uh if this was a a very if this is a very salty um this if this was a, a brine solution that had a varying like just a, a, a large amount of salt at the bottom and hardly any salt at the top you can kind of do that you can create that there are there's storage tanks that you can actually create that and they they're pretty good for temperature storage um, then you would have to do this integration because density is going to be a function of depth. All right. All right, now let's get to the uh, core of the material here. Um, by the way, I posted um, I posted on our channel on teams. So this is the general tab, right? This is the uh, you know, let me go back to. Uh... So here at the general tab, if you this is where we posted the link um, here is a video where I actually cover the next material. So if we run out of time, um, you can always look at this video. I'll probably just fin finish off or start or end, start where, where we finish today. But I'm going to post this on Beachboard in case you guys don't see this here. But this is in our repository. This is our team 3307. 33007 and it's there it's a youtube video of me doing the same lecture it's just me on a whiteboard that's it all right so let's talk about um you know um uh, what are we going to call it pascal's law so what is pascal's law Pascal's law, Pascal's law tells us that the pressure one is equal to pressure two, um, right? And then what you do is, if you assume that pressure one is equal to pressure two, then, uh, for example, and I'll, I'll draw how this, this interprets, then we we know that pressure is equal to force over area, so it's P one is equal to F one over A one, and we're going to say it's equal to pressure two, which we're going to say it's F two over A two. Right, and therefore we have that F2 over F1 is equal to A2 over A1. 
and that's Pascal's law. So what it does, it tells us what does this mean. Well, it, let's uh, let's assume that we're trying to. Uh, okay, let me try to do this a little bit better. Free sketch here. All right. So let's see. How did that look? Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. So let's assume we have a hydraulic lift, right? And that the hydraulic lift. Uh, I'll explain what this is here. Let me just draw a tank here. Oh my gosh. So let's let's assume we have this hydraulic tank and we have a piston here. It's easier to draw this and then um on paper and on a board than on a computer. But these are pistons, all right? So let's assume that um here is a liquid in here. It's a hydraulic liquid. All right, basically it's it's inside of every um a jack when a jack when you're going to lift the car, right? So what happens is if when you if you put a pressure if you, so this is here this is piston 1 or I I should say piston A and this one is piston If you put a force here uh, so if you put a, a force on this piston, my goodness. So it's, we'll call that force one. Then what's going to happen is, if with this, it's going to push. Let's assume we have a, a metal here and something to put a, piece, a weight here. Let's just say, let's call this one ton. Two thousand pounds, one one thousand kilograms, one ton. All right. So if you put a force here, F one, it's going to push back there, F two. Let's just write F two here, and it's going to obey Pascal's law here. So what's what's going to happen here is the force at one, the the force that I need to push piston A is going to be, um, I should say, let's 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 look at this different. The force at two. The force that's going to lift that large weight is equal to the force at one times a two over a one. And let's say that a two is equal to five times a one. Just say the the diameter of this large diameter is five times the diameter of this little diameter. So therefore, f two is equal to is going to be five times um, F1. So in other words, for me to lift this um, this weight up, right, it's going to be uh, F, it's going to take one, one fifth the amount of force that it's actually going to create. So if it's one ton, it would take one fifth of a ton for me. It's This is called mechanical leverage. Right, and this is that's so. Anyways, if you guys need better explanation, um, just take a look at the video that I posted. Let's see, and then it's it's also covered in our our lecture notes. So let's see, that would be right here. All right, so you go back to our lecture notes. Maybe it's easier just to refer here. Um, if you wanted to lift the car, and here is your pressure diameter. First piston, second uh, diameter of the, of the second piston. To get leverage, right? You just, um, you know, you just need a, you need one. Uh, depends on the size of the, of the pistons, you can get leverage that way. And it's basically based on the on the ratio of the large piston versus the small piston. Um, so to lift a, a car like that, and there's a little bit of, uh, you also need stroke, right? So usually what happens is you have to ratchet this a bunch of times, ratchet, 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 but it's and you do have leverage here on this other bar. So there's more things going on here. But re really, it means that anyone, even the weakest of us, pretty much can lift the car up. Maybe not really high, but you know enough to maybe lift the, one of the tires off of the ground without much effort, right? Maybe about 10 to 15 pumps of this lever. That's what uh, Pascal's Law tells us. All right. Um, 
I'm not going to cover any of this. So I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about um, measuring devices, but I, I really, really want to talk about this, right? So, um, so how do we find the pressure at the bottom of this fluid here? Uh, maybe I wonder if I could. Anyway, let me uh, let me go back to my notes. And I apologize. I'm going to get better at drawing on this tablet. But let's just say we have. Um, just say we have a tank, right? And there's three fluids. Uh, there's a fluid here. There's a temperature. There's a, there's another layer of fluid. Let's say there's three layers of fluid. One. Right. And then I wonder if I can see if I luck out here. Uh, So the first fluid, let's say it's blue. But oh, I had an opening. So that's not going to work. Um, if I go ahead and go back to my pen, maybe if I close this off, maybe if I go ahead and fill this with blue fluid. All right, so that's my first layer of fluid. Uh, my second layer of fluid, we'll pick red. And my third layer of fluid, uh, let's pick green. So those are my three layers of fluid. And what I want to do is I want to measure the, the pressure at the bottom. All right, so uh, I want to measure the pressure right here. I almost changed the color. Right, P1. How do I find the pressure of P1? Now, there is a density here. This is fluid one. There's a density here, fluid two. There's a density here. Three different fluids uh, that have three different densities. So the way I find the pressure, and I'm gonna assume here at the very top is is uh, P atmosphere, all right? The atmosphere pressure, which is, this is an open tank. All right, so we have pressure one. <clears throat> so let's, um, actually, let's, let's do this. So the pressure at one, you have to start basically adding the, uh, it's the sum of the forces in the y direction. But uh, what I'm gonna say is, we can just reason it, if, the, if this is a constant diameter tank, then A falls out of the equation, right? So in, in reality, you would be you would be summing the forces over the y direction, but I'm just going to summarize this really quick. So I'm going to say the pressure at one is equal to everything, all the, the weight of the, the different liquids that are above it, right? Uh, or the force caused by every liquid. So I'm going to say that it is, what's the pressure? It's going to be, that first contribution of that this fluid is equal to rho G, and I'm going to say it's H1. Um, actually, let's let's look at this this way here. H's are the dis are the thicknesses of the fluid. So, it's basically the the it, you have to account for all the fluid above it, the pressure caused by all the fluids. So it's gonna it, I'm gonna say the pressure at one is equal to rho g h one. So it's rho one g h one plus rho two g h two plus rho. I'm sorry. 3 g h 3 the only thing constant here is the is the g's right it's the same g and that's how you determine the pressure at one basically so there's a homework problem that does that it's very very simple it takes you right through right down to that problem all right now uh let's see if time permits what time is it um let me you guys have any questions um you guys, yeah, I know that's probably going s slow. Um, all right, I'm good. Glad, glad, to, glad, glad you guys think it's going well. Um, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Let's.